We're living in Colorado, high up in the Rocky Mountains, and we're at 8,000 feet. And we got all this beauty in Grand County. And this job comes up in Eagle River, Wisconsin. And my wife is from Pulaski, and I like it. What do you think? I don't know. There's a lot of water. I get here, fall in love with this place, and I can't believe all the beautiful lakes. And I get harassed by friends from the Rocky Mountains because I spent half of my career out there. And they're like, why would you go to Wisconsin? Are you going for the Packers? No. The Chiefs? The Broncos? No. No, no, no. You have no idea. And the only way you have an idea is if you live here or you come here. And we've got a lot of second homeowners that come up here that have that. They get that feeling too. But I'm up here year-round, and you know what a long way it was. <laughs> the Scandinavian syndrome is boom. Well, I just want you guys to know that, that I find three lakes. Love this place. Great town. I see people I know. I see a lot of people here I know. It's fantastic. It's a great place to live. And I love working on the Nicolet. I'm a forest ranger. And I'm out there to protect natural resources, open campgrounds as soon as I can, I'm sorry, water systems. I'm cutting trees as of today and yesterday. I've got a sore hip and I can feel, I'm 50 and that's supposed to be young, but I feel 70 today. So I'm trying to do things out here and I just have a story to share because I got to meet Steve yesterday and talk with him and I just can't wait until he gets up here because I love Sam Campbell, but I want to tell you, don't throw out, that we have the biggest federal, federally designated wilderness in the state of Wisconsin, right here, right next door. It's the Headwaters Wilderness. So I'd like to throw out a clue to those. The Headwaters is, of course, it's the Headwaters the name came from, the Pine, because the Pine River, that's the Headwaters of the Pine River. What a great place. We have an opportunity there. We have some of the biggest trees in the state there. Um, I have to remind people that you can't bicycle in there, you can't go no motorized vehicles. Um, it's, it's yours to enjoy, but you don't take anything from it. You're just a visitor, and it's a special place. And what I really like is it's a lot of bogs and wetlands. So there's not going to be a lot of anything going in there, or you're going to be really tough. It's like walking on half deflated basketballs. So, one story I'd like to share, and I'd like to do a song that I wrote about moving here because I got harassed. <laughs> the characters that live here in the Northwoods are unique. I think, I believe that to be in the all entire Northwoods areas of the United States. And those are Maine, the Maniacs, Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, way up in the top of New Hampshire where they say, well, we don't even vote. We live free or die, and we don't vote, and we don't wear a helmet. The very top of, of upstate New York, the Adirondack Mountains, that's the Northwoods. And then you come over, and the UP, the Upers, that's the Northwoods. Up there in the Bowery Waters, Ely area, that's the Northwoods. And of course, here, when I got here, everybody had an accent. Now I don't hear it anymore. And I get harassed in upstate New York where I originated from. So, when I got here, the characters, everything's deer hunting, the Packers, deer hunting, the Packers. And, <laughs> and I got this older guy that works for me, he's retired now, over in the Florence Ranger District. And I said, and he smoked candles like this all day. And I said, he must go to bed smoking those things, because his hands are always going like this. And he, he, I said, how often do you get in the back country? Because the tables were in bad shape out in Perch Lake. And he says, oh, I haven't been back there since 73. I said, what? This was 2007. I said, I better get back there and check on these places. Well, I found that the people, the locals, the people that love the visitors, take care of some of these dispersed areas because they love the land, they love their campsites. And when those areas aren't, because of our budgets and stuff, aren't being recognized, 
They take right over, they rape, they do all this stuff. But when I went out there to check out these beautiful, oh, I love the maples out there by Birch Lake in the Birch. They're just gorgeous. And the, what it is, is it goes around Birch Lake and we have five, six dispersed sites. And what we used to have when I got here, now we have wilderness toilets with these little boxes you can sit on. And you go to the bathroom, there's no walls. <laughs> Thank God we don't have a lot of moose here. But <laughs> well, we do have bears. And I've heard stories of people going to the bathroom and then here comes a bear. But anyways, you like to have walls. You feel protected. But we had this outhouse. And it's the old outhouse that didn't have the vault. The, 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 they would pour vaults in the back. We had these things that we used to line. We would pour lime in them. I go out there and this porcupine has made it look like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. I mean, this thing looked awful. And I said, wow, welcome to the Northwoods. We wouldn't have anything like this where I was working in a natural recreation area. So I'm out there and there's this big boulder there. And I'm on my way out. And just as I start hiking out, here comes a couple from Chicago. I'm going to make this story short. They're coming in, and I can smell the perfume just coming for about a half a mile. And I said, hey, my, it was no place. And here they come walking up. She's got mascara running down her eyes because the black flies are terrible. And it was bad mosquito season. I think Minnesota and Wisconsin were playing a football game that day because we had mosquitoes and the black flies. <laughs> <laughs> and she's getting bit up, and she's wearing the perfume, and she's yelling at him. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, we're newlyweds. I said, wow, this is starting this early. This is crazy. <laughs> so I said, uh, well, well, where are you guys playing? I go, well, he wants to hike all the way around this lake, and I'm not into this. That's a long hike. And these are brand new boots, and I look, and they were brand new Merrells. And she said she bought them at Bass Pro, and this guy loves the outdoors, and she could care less. She did not want to be there. So she takes her boot off, because I said, I can look at that, and she had a big blister, so I put some mold skin on. I'm sitting there talking, and she's telling me how much she's afraid of spiders. I don't know where that came from. We're in the forest. Why are we talking about spiders? There's other things to worry about. Like, Look up for widow makers or something, and she's a widow makers. No, we don't have black widows, no brown recluse, unless they pick a train running up here. And you, you really don't have to worry about poisonous spiders. But she kept talking about spiders. When we get up, he breaks down the map and he wants me to show him an easier hike or a wet way would be short. And I said, well, she doesn't sound like she wants to go, but let's see what happens with the mole skin that I put wrapping on her back of her heel. So she says, I have to go to the bathroom. She says it to her new husband. Her husband. And she says, are there any bathrooms? And I said, no. This is where you're going to dig a hole. It depends on if it's one or if it's two. And then I said, I just got with a job here, so I just remembered that that outhouse was down there. Well, this old guy hadn't been back there since 1972. Who do you think's cleaning this bathroom? So I said, I got an outhouse right here. She would rather take the, I would rather have gone outside. She would rather take the walls, the four walls, than to take a risk. So she starts walking toward the outhouse, and she just says, is there any spiders in this outhouse? <laughs> The caretaker, Bob Wellingerski, there from the UP, comes down here every once in a while and cleans that. But uh, there's no, I mean, come on, it's, you got, you're taking your chances. So make sure you look around. And, you know, there's not going to probably do webs and stuff. So, and then she said, okay, so she went into the bathroom. He's got the map down, and I'm looking at the map, and I hear a scream, and I look up. I thought it was a spider. <laughs> the door flies open. Her pants are still down to her knees. She actually was levitating and floating to her knee. <laughs> Who runs with pants down to her knees? She certainly did, and she made it. Not to him. She jumped into my arms, grasped hold of me, 
wouldn't let go. I was some supermodel, and I look over at the outhouse because something caught my eye, and I look, and there goes a black bear. <laughs> I'm really confused. So, no gun, nothing, no mace. I just stand my ground, I get her, I pull her to the side, I'm watching the bear, and the bear doesn't even look at me, it just keeps on down the front door. She's just in a panic. Now I'm confused. He's screaming like a girl, more than her. I said, calm down, calm down, can you tell me what happened? She said, look, look in there. It's not clean. <laughs> I go with her service brow probably and they just got it on the wall. She's like, I just was going to ignore it. I just went right for it and there was a couple. And then there was, no, there was no spider. And then, and then, I sit down and I started growing up. And I heard something below me. Make sure you guys get into Mercedes and then you make it home. They got a nice SUV, we get out there, and I had to get one in. I had to. And I knocked on the window one last time as they turned their AC on, and I looked across from him because he was he was driving, and I looked at her and I said, I just want to know one thing. Are you still afraid of spiders? <laughs> she gave me a really funny wave and then went on over. And I have never seen them again. <laughs> so, real quick, I want to do a song because I want the doctor to get up here. <sighs> Same Campbell, the dust. We got our own little John Muir. We got our own Bob. Uh, we got, yeah, we got like uh, Leopold here that was here type of guy. And, oh, can't wait to hear this stuff. But I got a song I wrote about. And it is a Four Seasons song. And I wrote, because I was getting harassed from my Rocky Mountain friends, and I still, I'll ask my wife, <laughs> as the case from Stevens Point over here, do I still say Wisconsin wrong? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You think I would learn, you know? Anyways, I kept saying, living at 8,000 feet, there's nothing that lives up here but marmots and elk. I mean, really? What are we idiots? We can't have a garden. We don't really ski that much because we can't afford a downhill ski. We only cross country ski. That means we have to go up and come down real fast and not make turns. <laughs> so I said, Let's move over some lakes. There's nothing we can have a garden. Because there's spring, summer, fall, and winter. And if you ever lived in the Rockies, it goes from summer to winter. So here's my song. Round and go round in the same sweet circle. It's a dizzy, dreamy dance we do. Seasons turn and the feelings are changing and the skies are bright when it's constantly Now the feeling of spring's like a birth of a baby and the sun shines warm like a mother's smile it's a song of the robin, it's a sweet taste of maple, it's falling in love, three late style. And around we go around in the same sweet circle, it's a dizzy, dreamy dance we do. Seasons turn and the feelings are changing, and the sky is 
so brave when he was dancing the room. When the summers get hot, we walk down to the Pine River, where the mosses are soft as the bed of a queen. Come and lay me down, come and lay me down beside me. Beneath trees of green and around we go round in the same sweet circle. It's a dizzy dreamy dance we do. Seasons turn and the feelings are changing. And the skies are bright with its cats and blue. Nights are getting colder and the leaves are changing color And love is flowing like homemade wine We share the food, celebrate the harvest Oh man, these cheese heads are surely fine And around we go around in the same sweet circle It's a dizzy, dreamy dance we do Seasons turn and the feelings are children And the skies are bright when it's constantly blue Alright, this winter one was a long one this year though, I'm sorry <laughs> Well, winters are long and the winds they get wicked And 20 below, that ain't no big deal But there's diamonds on the snow as we walk out on Big Lake Diamonds on the store, these treasures are real. And around we go round in the same sweet circle. It's a dizzy dream dance we do. Seasons turn, and the feelings are changing, and the skies are bright. When it's cats in blue. So let's, let's start by establishing a little context. So, so Jeff went first because he talked to you about the National Forest. And if we take ourselves back about 100 years or so, the idea of, the, of a National Forest, the idea of conservation was as foreign to most people as the idea of a fab lab is to some people today. It just wasn't, it wasn't within the realm of possibility. It wasn't thought about. Um, if we take ourselves back 100 years or more during the time when Sam was a youth, um, we find that the way that America thought about its natural resources was that they were unending, that trees were another form of weeds just there to be cut. People never believed that you could run to the end of these natural resources, and further, they didn't understand the connection between these resources and ourselves. And so, so during Sam's life, we were undergoing a very profound change. Um, it was during the time when our forests were basically cut down to nothing. It was a time when the land up here was referred to as the cutover because it was a sea of stumps. Um, there were an estimated one billion board feet of lumber um, to the north and east of Rhinelander where we are, and, and the lumber people wanted it all. Um, Chicago had burned in 1871, and Chicago was basically rebuilt with the forests of northern Wisconsin. That's where they went. When Mrs. O'Leary's cow tipped over the lantern, the forests of northern Wisconsin went south. So, so we looked at the land in a different way back then. This was also during the time that the railroad was coming into prominence. How many people know the year that the CNW came to Three Lakes? Guess it back. 1881. 1881. Is it 1881? 1881 is when the CNW found the Three Lakes. Wow. And I still marvel at that when, I, when we hiked north on the Three Eagle Trail because you realize that that railroad was built with nothing that said Caterpillar on the side of it. 
None of the saws said steel on them. That was all cross-cut saws and people moving dirt by hand and with horses, and I marvel at what they were able to accomplish. Certainly my core back wouldn't take it. I don't know about theirs. Um, but the trains, because the highways didn't exist, were the way that people went on vacation. You went places on a train. The airlines didn't exist. Roads really didn't exist. So you went places on a train. And recognizing that, the CNNW sponsored Sam as its official lecturer from 1934 until 1956, 22 years. And Sam was seen as a way by the railroad through his message to get people on trains to come to the North Woods. So, who is this person, Sam Campbell, that we talk about and we hold in high esteem here in Three Lakes? Born in August 1st, 1895 in Watsika, Illinois. For those of you that haven't been there, Watsika is a town about 80 miles south of Chicago. It's on the prairie, kind of on the Illinois-Indiana border. Um, remembering that John Deere had built the steel plow only 50-some years before Sam was born, it's easy to imagine that big parts of that prairie had not yet been broken. It's a very flat place with very few trees. The Iroquois River runs through Watsika, um, and it cuts through the beautiful uh, prairie loam to a depth of about 30 feet, and there's you know, cottonwood trees that grow along the river, and it's a place where you can lay on the ground in the summertime and watch thunderstorms build and see them coming for miles. And in the wintertime, it's a place where there's nothing to hold the wind back, and it howls. Kind of like living in Minnesota when you realize from time to time that there's nothing more substantial between you and the North Pole than a barbed wire fence. <laughs> so, so Sam, at, at about the time that he was three, Sam's family moved to Chicago. He was uh, raised and educated in Chicago. He loved nature from the beginning, and his mother, who had a very big influence on his life, was heard to say more than once that this child should be a naturalist. Sam writes about being in school and being asked to recite a lesson of one kind or another, which he couldn't do, but he could tell you what what the sandhill cranes were doing outside. He could tell you what the turtles were doing outside, but the basics of a math lesson, well, mm, that didn't really hold his attention. Um, he served in the Army during World War I. Um, he had graduated from high school. We're not quite sure when. We do know that he graduated from Hyde Park High. Um, as America got into World War I, we only had about 100,000 people in the Army, which we knew wasn't going to be enough, so the Selective Service started in order to get people into the military for World War I. On the first day the draft became um, a thing, Sam was issued a draft card because he was not married, he had no dependents. Um, he went into the Army and became rose to the rank of corporal, serving his time at Camp Grant just outside of Chicago. He was actually in the Army a little bit less than a year. We have, his, we have his discharge papers. We have all the records from his time in service. Um, so he gets out of service, and there were a lot of commercial careers that he could have had. He could have been a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, doctor, lawyer, any number of things. But for Sam Campbell, working in a cube, working in a factory, working in a place like that, was, to put it in his own words, about as appropriate as trying to put feathers on a frog. <laughs> it was just, that was not his gig. Um, so he, he enjoyed teaching music, he taught boxing, he did, sold real estate, did a lot of things. But he was also affected deeply by the death of his mother on June 16, 1929. His mother, Kitty, whom he held in high esteem and referred to as Wigaman, the Ojibwe word for mother, was diagnosed with leukemia in May and died in June. And, and we have to recognize that, that back in 1929, though they could recognize what leukemia was, because they could put your blood under a slide and see the increased number of cells, they had no way to treat it. They didn't have chemotherapy, which didn't come around until after World War II. They had no drugs or anything. So from the time she was diagnosed to the time she died was about a month, and for a sensitive young man like Sam, watching his mother die 
in a very painful way must have been a very profound experience. Shortly after her death, he had an encounter with what he believed to be God. And he writes about it in a book that he titled The Conquest of Grief. It is his very first book. It is a very philosophical book. It is very deep, but it is a very worthy read. And in this read, he takes on our whole cultural concept of life and death and the difference between the two. And, and for those of you who have ever had a brush with death or, or lost a loved one very close to you, I recommend that you, if you have a chance, read Sam's The Conquest of Grief. It's a very, very interesting book. And then he went ahead and he married at the age of 45. He married Ginny Adams on June 10th, 1941. We have um, the records on that. He got married in St. Louis, Missouri on the steps of his sister's house. Um, we don't know a lot about Ginny. We know that she was a secretary in Chicago. We know that she heard him on a radio program that he used to have called the Sanctuary Hour. We, knew, we know that because of the Sanctuary Hour broadcast, she came to a party where he was at, and she decided at that party that was the man she was going to marry, and yes, indeed, they did. And so Sam, at the ripe age of 40-something, became an unbachelor, and um, he said it was the grandest thing he had ever done. So how did Sam Campbell come to Three Lakes? Well, the, the, the notes that we have, the reflections that we have say that the Campbell family came here about 1909 for the first time when Sam was 14 years old. Three Lakes in 1909 was a very different place than Three Lakes is now. The main street was dirt. The sidewalks were, were boardwalks and there were probably quite a few more saloons on Main Street than there are gift shops on Main Street today. It was a very, very different kind of a place. So the Campbell family came up here on the train from Chicago and were undoubtedly met by um, one of the local merchants who they went in, bought their dry goods, he put, up, he put them, their luggage, all their dry goods on his wagon, took them over to the dock on what was known then as, uh, I forget the name of it, it's now Townline Lake, I think Mill Pond Lake back in those days. And then they went by launch from Mill Pond Lake, the planting ground, and somehow they found their way over to the east shore of Four Mile Lake where they camped. And they camped on the east shore of Four Mile for a number of years, started coming regularly in 1912. That upper picture is a picture of their campground. Um, and he purchased the island in the middle of the lake in 1937, this particular island, and the records go back. There's a mainland component attached to it and all kinds of history about how land was surveyed before and after the dam up on Long Lake was put in and the lake levels were raised. Okay. About the time he graduated from high school until the late 1930s, Sam Campbell spent a lot of time in what most of us these days would call discernment, trying to figure out what was his calling, what was his role in the world. Um, and it describes an interior search for the answer. Oops, sorry. It describes the interior search for an answer to the question of one's vocation. What are you going to do with your life? There's a spiritual definition of vocation that we Lutherans are used to. It's how are you going to use God's gifts in the world. There's a secular definition of vocation that says, what are you going to do to earn money? Hopefully those two reconcile themselves. And in Sam's case, it took a long time for him to reconcile what was going to be his vocation, what was his calling. So we, we know that he grew up in Chicago, and if you think about Chicago 100 years ago, it was during the time of Prohibition. It was during the time when Jane Addams had uh, established Hull House. It was during the time when Upton Sinclair had written The Jungle about life in the meatpacking plants in Chicago. Chicago was a gritty place 100 years ago. And the noise and the, the 
way of looking at the world was grading on sand. He wanted to be a naturalist. And a hundred years ago, being a naturalist was, you know, that was just something that was not popular. Um, the National Forest had only been established in 1911. Conservation was an unheard term. So being a naturalist was, was not the usual thing people did. But Sam knew that he had to be a naturalist. He knew he had to be part of something connecting people with nature to, to, to help them to understand what was deep inside of him. So at the end of it all, after, after a lot of discernment, Sam was paddling his canoe around Four Mile Lake one day, and he came to the conclusion, and these are Sam's words, that he had been discouraged by militant con conservation People saying, you will do this, you will not do this. People setting aside great tracts of national forest where nobody could go. And he was shocked too at public indifference to nature matters, matters regarding nature. But I saw clearly that in this latter situation, whatever talents I had as photographer, lecturer, writer, would find their best field in seeking to awaken nature appreciation. So, so we have a letter from Sam um, in 1938 to a guy by the name of Charles Kelly, who was an attorney for the people who were trying to implement the Boundary Waters. And we have a letter from a guy by the name of Ernest Oberholzer, who was trying to preserve the Boundary Waters, to Sam Campbell in 1938, recommending Sig Olson of Ely, Minnesota as a guide during Sam's treks to the Boundary Waters. In his lectures, in his travels, Sam gradually became to be in the company of other naturalists and conservationists. He saw how some people were trying to preserve the natural spaces, and Sam said, I need to take a different track. The track that he chose to take is a more invitational tract. A tract saying, I'm going to go down to the city and I'm going to talk to groups like this and I'm going to invite you to come to the woods to feel what I feel, to feel the peace that I feel. So Sam very deliberately with other conservationists decided to take a very different approach to his trade to, to be very invitational to people about coming to nature. So, what did that look like? Well, Sam would spend his summers in Three Lakes with Ginny, living out on the island. Um, Sam bought the island, and local architect Cy Williams designed a cottage for him, and as Sam described it, the cottage had so many windows, there weren't enough walls to hold up the roof, or so he thought. <laughs> When he married Ginny in 1941, getting married meant that the cottage all of a sudden grew indoor plumbing. The outhouse wasn't going to work anymore. So every spring about ice out, about now, Sam and Ginny would come back to Three Lakes to the island on Four Mile Lake where Sam would make films. Films of the animal friends out on the island and those films became the topics of books, like How's Inky the Porcupine, or Too Much Salt and Pepper the Porcupines, or Eeny Meeny Miny Mo and Still Mo the Red Squirrels. Sam talks in his books about coming to the island and meeting the neighbors, all these wild animals, and he gave every one of them a name, and giving them a name was important because every animal is different than every other animal. You and I are all different from each other. So in giving them a name, Sam gave them something more than just calling them a red squirrel. He gave them identity. So, so he would make movies of his animal friends and their antics. He would do writing in the summertime and prepare to go back to Chicago in the wintertime. Chicago initially and other parts of the country more on um, to do lectures and, and uh, so summers also meant sing-alongs around the campfire. Sam was a great musician. He taught guitar. He loved guitar. And so those that knew Sam talk about coming out to the islands for sing-alongs around the campfire. Canoe country. Sam loved what we now know as the BWCAW. 
It is reported reliably that at one point he spent the last money he had in his pocket for a trip to the Boundary Waters. But he didn't care. He knew the reward was going to be worth it. Um, as I said, he was introduced to Sig Olson in 1938. For those of you that have read the Campbell books, how many of you have ever wanted to go to Sanctuary Lake? <laughs> Sanctuary Lake is a, is a place that is predominantly talked about in Tippecanoe in Canada, too, and um, one other one that just escapes me off the tip of my tongue. It's a beautiful little lake in somewhere in the Boundary Waters, and it, it's been the topic of much discussion in different circles. How can we go to Sanctuary Lake? How can we find it? And it was an idea that obsessed me for a while until I found a letter that Jenny wrote in December of 1962 after Sam died, and in the letter she says that Sanctuary Lake was actually a fictitious place that she didn't know that Sam had invented. One of Sam's, one of Sam's techniques in writing um, was a technique called fiction based on fact. So he would make up these little places based on fact. As far as we know, based on that letter, Sanctuary Lake is not a real place you can go to. Sad as that is. Okay? <coughs> So Sam was a very prolific writer, and we talk about his books in two very different veins. The first set of books, um, the oops, the first set of books, Conquest of Grief, Sanctuary Letters, uh, Nature's Messages of Peace, were all self-published by Sam in the 1930s. You can find all of these books on. Um, all of these books on this slide are out of print. You can find them if you do some looking at used bookstores. I found, I found Nature's Messages, this one, online and picked it up for about 20 bucks. Um, you can find Sanctuary Letters at used bookstores for about four or five hundred bucks a piece. They're little volumes uh, bound in velvet. Nature's Messages of Peace I found at a used bookstore for about a hundred bucks. I know of only one copy of Conquest of Grief, and that's the copy that Doris Goldsworthy had. That's the only copy I've ever seen. I've looked for it in used bookstores. I can't find it. A common theme that runs through all these volumes is A, they're very philosophical, and B, you don't find a lot of reference to people in them. Sam will talk about people, but not by name. In writing style, if you've read Sigrid Olson's books, these books are very, these books in writing style are very similar to um, the introspective philosophical writing that Sigrid Olson does. Which brings us to the Living Forest series. All of, basically all of them written after Sam met Ginny. The writing style in these books, which are also commonly called the Living Forest series, changes dramatically. Instead of philosophy being the main theme of these books, now the animals are the theme of these books. It's the antics of the animals and the life lessons they teach us. These books are still in print. You can get them at the Historical Society. Um, you can buy them online. You can get these books basically anywhere. Um, and they are a really, really fun read. These are the books that when I was a kid, back in the 1960s, coming to Three Lakes on a rainy day, Mom and Dad would take us to the library to check out Sam Campbell books because we couldn't do anything. We'd come home and read these. So these are the ones that you can still find in print. They're really, really fun but understand they're a very different writing style than his earlier writings. So in the wintertime, Sam would be out lecturing for the CNNW. Um, each fall, just before freeze-up, he and Ginny would hit the road. Uh, the lecture schedule was pretty much seven nights a week. So let's take you back to the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. <coughs> TV doesn't really exist. For entertainment, 
Bless you. For entertainment, people come out to a lecture like this because that's how they get out of the house and, and hear something. So Sam was on the road basically seven nights a week and twice on Sunday. And the lecture was generally a 16 millimeter film with Sam talking and Ginny running the projector. We know, we know from our research that Sam had a script that he followed in his lectures, but sadly we don't have any of those scripts. Um, after he died, a lot of stuff, bless you, a lot of stuff went away. We don't know where. We think a lot of stuff accidentally went in the trash. I would love to have some of those scripts. Um, and the message, as always, was the love of nature revealing the wonders of God and our connection to creation. So Sam died very suddenly of a heart attack on April 13, 1962. Mere statistics tell us that during his life he produced about 150,000 feet of nature film and gave 10,000 lectures in 30 years to 9 million people. That's, that's, that's a legacy. Uh, his life was a gift to conservation, but again, in a very different way than people were used to seeing conservation. Sam invited people to come to the woods. In fact, the only one of his films that he ever narrated was the last film that he did, and it's called Come to the North Woods. It's about a 17-minute film. My good buddy Terry Dodge, the filmmaker, um, got it digitized it, and you can get it, you can buy it over at, um, over at the museum for, I don't know how much they charge over at the museum, but you can get Sam's last film, which has his voice. It's digitized, it's beautiful. Uh, the, whoops. The 12 Books of the Living Forest series are back in print. I believe they're being published by AB Publishing. Um, there's a Sam Campbell exhibit at the Three Lakes Museum. Interesting statistic, did you know the last word I had from the museum, every summer approximately 200 people come from around the world to the Three Lakes Museum to learn more about Sam. Really? Yes. 200 people every year. Um, New generations are discovering the timeless message that the outdoors is good for us. So this has been a very interesting part of the journey for me. So yes, I went to school and, and got my doctorate. And getting your doctorate means you get very, very steeped in um, a topic called epistemology. And epistemology is basically how do we know that we know something? How can we how, what can we do so that we can say we know something, to claim that we know something? So you learn a lot about the scientific method. You learn a lot about interpretive research. You learn about research as a way of being able to make a knowledge claim. So back in the 1930s, Sam made the claim that living in nature is good for us. He made it based on what he knew in his gut. Fast forward to the January 2016 issue of National Geographic magazine, just as a point of reference. There's a beautiful article in there titled, This is Your Brain on Nature. It took about 80 years, but our scientific method way of claiming to be able to know something finally got its arms around, how can we peer into people's physiology and prove that being in the woods is good for you and measure the different ways that your physiology changes from your time in the city to your time in the woods. Sam knew, but didn't have the evidence to support it. 80 years later, we now have the evidence that says these, these are all the things that, these are all, excuse me, the good things that happen to your body when you go out in nature and live in the trees. And we're discovering more and more connections between our physiology, our body, and nature every day. So Sam knew something. It just took 80 years for our science to catch up to what Sam already knew. 
So, a small amount of advertising, if you permit me. Myself and a gentleman by the name of Terry Dodge, who's a filmmaker in Berrien Springs, Michigan, are working on a biography and a documentary film of Sam's life. Um, we have a website out there called philosopheroftheforest.com where you can take a look at what we're doing, you can track our progress, and if you'd like to make a monetary donation, I'm sure Terry would really appreciate that. Um, to date, we have taken um, Come to the Northwoods, we've digitized it, it's for sale. Very shortly, another one of Sam's films, sadly not narrated by Sam, called Land of the Voyagers. It's a, it's a story of his trip into the Boundary Waters. We'll be getting released. They're done digitizing it. Um, they've written a script for it, and they're putting some voices to it. That should be out fairly soon. And I'm happy to report that the biography piece that I'm working on has been accepted at AB Publishing, and I've been working with the editor to try and get that edited and out to you folks so that you can learn more about Sam. Okay? So, um, and I will leave you with this. Like Sam, I have spent my life bouncing back and forth between the environs of the city. I lived in the, Twitty, in the Twin Cities for a long time. I still have a house there. And I've been coming to Three Lakes. So I've been bouncing back and forth between the city and the woods. And I understand the dichotomy between life in the city and life out here that Sam understood so deeply. And so I leave you with this quote from one of Sam's favorite authors, although from one of Sam's favorite authors, I come here to find myself, it is so easy to get lost in the world with a picture of the island. Thank you. Questions. The Sam Campbell Trail was developed. Um, I'm a little, Bruce, can you help us with that? Well, I know my dad was part of me. Do you remember when the trail was dedicated? I think it was like the late 80s, early 90s. Late 80s. I was eight, I was at Girl Scout camp, so what was I, eight, nine years old? So it would have been the mid, mid to late 80s. And I believe that the trail now is maintained by the Forest Service because the Forest Service has taken it over. I know when, when bridges need to be repaired, it's the Forest Service that you have to get approval from and they kind of lead the effort. And I know that the museum works in that, in that arena as well, so. Are there any other questions? Yes, a question that doesn't have a short answer. Um, but I will tell you when, uh, back a few years ago, when I, I never, so I read Sam and I never completely forgot him. But a few years ago, when I hit a major birthday that had a zero behind it, <laughs> my family asked me, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, hmm. And I asked for a set of Sam's Living Forest series books. And they got them for me, and I read them and fell in love with Sam all over again. But now, we had the internet. So I could start doing some researching, and I reached out to the Chicago and Northwestern Historical Society, and I just started widening the circle of people that I was talking to to learn more about Sam. And along the way, I became involved with Terry Dodge, the filmmaker, and the rest, as they say, is history. But, but the more I read of him and the more I um, noodled on him and got inside my head with him, the more he wouldn't let me go. Yes? Do you have a publishing date for the book? Sadly, no. <laughs> Other questions? Did you have any formal ecological or science education? I do not. My, my no, I'm sorry, did Sam. Oh, did Sam? Yes. 
You know, we don't know. We know that he went to the University of Chicago and, because we can find the registration records, and we believe, I think the other one was the University of Illinois, but they won't give us any, um, they won't give us any idea of what courses we, of what courses he took. We know he didn't graduate. Yes? Yes, Sam and Ginny's house is still out on the island. It is in private ownership. Um, the house is in very beautiful shape. I've been in it a couple times. It's been added on to, but again, it's in private ownership. And so, you know, when I go out there with the canoe or when we go out there walking, we walk around the island. We don't walk on the island because I want to respect the private ownership. Other questions? If there are, yeah. When Sam was hired by the railroad, was that part of their kind of campaign to encourage everyone to come up here to vacation? Yes. Right? Okay. The question was, was, was the rail, did the railroad intentionally hire Sam as a way of luring people onto the trains? Yes. Yes. They saw, they saw something unique in him and they, they, they glommed onto it very quickly. Another piece of research I'd love to be able to get at are Sam's income tax records to find out where he made, you know, how he supported himself. Um, but I don't believe I'm going to be able to do that either. It'd be interesting. Other questions? So we don't know who was hiring him to give his lectures? It was the Chicago and Northwestern, but we don't know what other sources of income he may have had. Other questions? So if there are no questions, are there any answers? <laughs> 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 All right, thank you.